Hi guys, it's Vertis here. So in this video, I'm going to scroll through our Discord community channel, more specifically in the work in progress and also the art feedback request forums. I thought I'd do a format like this where I'm talking straight directly to you. It's a better form of communication instead of typing it out, which uh, takes kind of a lot of time. Also an opportunity to give demos of feedback. It's often something we do in the games industry. So say, for example, an artist comes for um, a request on feedback when I'm doing art directorship. Usually we just open up a, a Teams conversation with that and we would do some live draw overs. So in this one, we're actually going to cover quite a broad range of topics. So we're going to be covering good topology workflows, also a likeness sculpt, a stylized character and also a rendered shot in Unreal Engine. So with works in progress, obviously it can be a bit embarrassing or it can be quite nerve wracking to post your work. But I promise you it's a really good process to get into. Um, often what happens with works in progress is that you'll receive feedback for something that hasn't been approached or finished yet. So say, for example, you hadn't done or done too much work on a hand or a foot. You're almost guaranteed to get feedback for that. My suggestion is just you've got to take that on the chin and really focus on the reasons why you're asking for feedback and posting works in progress. So just as a disclaimer for um, any of the artworks that I'm showing on behalf of the artist, chances are that certain areas they might have not worked on too much. Uh, so don't hold it against them. And I, and I certainly won't hold it against you. But hopefully in seeing other people get feedback, you can apply these tips and processes to your own work. So make sure you join the 3D Mutiny Discord. I'll link it in the chat channel below. Post your works in progress. Also, a lot of people are giving really good forms of feedback themselves. So if you're interested in just learning and improving as an artist, um, one way to improve is actually almost teach or give feedback yourself. So throw yourself into this environment, receive feedback, give feedback, and then hopefully I'll be doing more of these in the future. So the first bit of feedback is for a user called Fiori, and he's doing a Tom Holland likeness. So likeness is extremely hard. You always hit the uncanny valley. Well done for attempting something like that. It can be a bit of a, a torturous process. It mentions that everything's handmade and no texturing XYZ. So that's totally fine. Um, texturing XYZ, usually you find that those sorts of details get lost anyway. I certainly only use them if they're on sort of like cinematic productions. Um, I usually prefer to just use large broad brushes, especially when it comes to the games industry. So first of all, he's done a really good job in terms of skin. Like if you zoom in really close, that poor detail is quite nice. It's not too big. It's not too small. And if you zoom out from a distance, um, especially the likeness is, I can definitely see it's Tom Holland, even though he's got his Spider-Man suit that's not throwing off too much. In terms of shaders, the hair shaders representing quite well, especially like the lighting that he's done on there. Nice to see the way it's presented. It seems that he's sort of like uh, in a street or an alley. Don't know if it was purposeful that you've hidden the ear on the side, so we can't see that. But yeah, in terms of skin surface and shading, especially when you go up close, it actually does look quite realistic, but definitely got a couple of pointers and feedback for you. Okay, so I got some pictures here for reference. I think the first thing that is really noticeable is the expression of the face and whether that's matching Tom Holland and basically the scene that it's in. As it is right now, he's kind of got this... Um, sad look and that can often come from usually the rotation of the eyebrows of where they're going and also the squinting of the eyes so there's a lot of emotion that's in there uh, also focus on basically the corners of the lips even if you move those a fraction it can actually change the expression completely what i did was examples of tom so for example here it's on the front cover of a magazine it's more of like a pouting, pouting sort of epic look and also some mid-action shots so you might want to approach it in the sense of actually sculpting him inside of a pose because um, right now it's looking a bit neutral and therefore he's looking a bit sad. So to basically remove that saddish expression, I'd shorten this area so it's not got so much of an overhang. What you're basically trying to avoid is any any flat angles here that give that sad effect. You can see basically by the angle, what you get is these two angles, which is usually indicative of a sad emotion. If you want to kind of make him a bit more happy or epic, it usually involves just rounding this off. Um, so it opens up the eyes and it bit, looks a bit more bright. Also, the angle of the eyebrows is going to be important. So for example, if you're going for more of a squinting look, that gives off the example of like he's focusing, which can be quite cool. Next point is basically going to be around the nose, but primarily the underlying structure. So if we look on this example, he's got quite a pinch in his nose and it opens up to more of like a spherical area. So with the anatomy of the nose, you usually see this sort of pinching area right there. Um, his one's quite pronounced and you can see by the shadow. So you might want to replicate that shadow. And if you look here, it seems to be quite missing. What you probably want to do is increase the structure on the front end of the 
the nose. So if we're looking at the nose from the top, instead of having this sort of shape, going to have more of a squared look. Um, and then towards the bottom, it's going to pinch. So we're going to have a much smaller section like this. So that's just the observation with his specific nose. While on the topic of the nose as well, he's got a lot of asymmetry. So for example, this side of the nostrils looping down quite a lot. Um, if you introduce that into here, you might have, it's not so clear from this angle, you might have done that already. Asymmetry can often help when it comes to likeness. In terms of looking at it from a distance, I'd say that his face is getting slightly elongated. So looking, it's looking very long here. But on a lot of the photos, he has quite a wide head. Sometimes it's quite an illusion when they have large hair, it makes it look like their face is wide. And it also can be a bit of an illusion depending on the camera focal length and how close the camera is to the face. Um, but from my experience, I think what's happening here is the chin is falling way too far and that's elongating the face. And also potentially you're, use, you're losing a bit of mass. So you can see he's quite defined on your one. But if you look into a couple of references, you can see this sort of like childish bulkiness. That'll be dependent on his age as well. So over the years, if this is sort of like a, an earlier shot, he's obviously going to have more puffiness. So you're just going to have to decide on which age you're going for. But in general, I can see that he's got quite, kind of like more puffiness around the face. So what you'd have to do is move the chin up, not widen the mouth, but increase the bulkiness uh, around this sort of area. And that's going to give a widening effect to the jaw. Again, on the nose, you can see this sort of angle. You've got this quite angled and staggered nose that goes like this. So if you can replicate that um, it's going to take the flatness away from the nose and have it a bit more accurate. You can even see it on this one. He's got that pronounced uh, nose look from the side. Also note the what we previously talked about was the arching. This is quite nice and nice and rounded. With the puffiness, what you can see from the cheekbone basically going down here, it's very concave. So it's sort of pointing out. And then we've got the mouth barrel that's here. And then what's happening in between, you've got this divot. Um, so that happens with people with like very low body fat percentage. So this could be like the older version of Tom. Um, but if we look on this example, that area is very much filled in. Can't see much of a difference. The only concave bit is which is leading under his cheekbone. So maybe just leave the divot in here to express his cheekbone. And then basically just bulk this up slightly and also around here while keeping that sort of mouth shape. Another thing I potentially notice is the, the thinness of the hair or basically the wispiness. The way I like to think about it is if I was going to touch that just by looking at the picture looks very faint and almost like cobwebby. Whereas if you look on a couple of the references, he's got a lot of grease and uh, clustering that's going on in that hair. So a lot of it's being bulked up together. So you might want to change the arrangement of the fibers that you've rendered out. So just increase the clumping and re-render those cards. Um, or you just want to make the hair strands themselves a lot thicker. So I do that a lot in, in the games industry because from a distance, um, a lot of the hair fibers get lost and it becomes this kind of smooth, wispy cotton. And you can see it from a distance. Where Whereas with these shots, it's quite clear and defined where the large highlights are and where the, the big shadows are. Basically, what you'll be doing is fighting against the shader slightly. So I'm assuming this is maybe an Unreal Engine. You get a lot of uh, translucency and subsurface effects that happen based on the normals of your planes. So I'm assuming you've got the normals all, all facing outwards. In fact, just look at it. It might be in Marmoset, actually. It's it's kind of not, not so clear. But yeah, definitely my suggestion is just look at one of these hair cards, make bespoke hair cards that fit these individual strands. And that's going to have a, a kind of like a more cinematic look to it. So usually what I do with likeness sculpts is use a form of triangulation. So if you want to measure parts of, for example, let's do the nose. What I usually like to do is just draw triangles in specific areas. And then I'll break that up into triangles. For example, uh, we can take this to the center of the lip is I'd go back to whatever I'm drawing and just try and replicate those triangles. And what you'll usually find is that the triangles look different. And then from that observation, you can start to make changes. So just from drawing these very faint ones, uh, you can make an observation on sort of like how long each one of these is in comparison to each other. Uh, the main thing that I see is basically how wide his nose is. The nose is sort of uh, aligned if I try and follow up the face, kind of falls short just on the inside of the eye. Um, so obviously you're you're somewhat guessing a bit of perspective here. Now on this image, it seems that I guess his, his nostrils are flaring, so it can put it off slightly. But even with that regard, you can see where the nose connects to the main face. It seems to be more in line with his eyes, like the inners of his eyes. So it's very subtle. And what you're going to be doing is just moving these inwards and slightly up. And what you can probably already see anyway in between his eyes is quite large. Um, so if you couple it with the confluence of having sort of like a wide bridge here and the observation that we made with the triangles, uh, you can note that you just bring that in, it's going to be slightly more accurate with likeness. Um, the problem with that and the torture 
of likenesses, you'll make those changes and it's going to throw off the perspective of other parts. So I suggest working from the outside first. So any sort of comments that we made on head shape and length, you do those first, make these sort of changes, these global changes, and then start to think about um, aligning with triangulation. So for example, uh, if we use triangulation to fix part of the jaw, what you can do is just draw over the jaw. I usually do it from the ends here and then go up towards the cheekbone or where the ear connects. Uh, and you can do the same on yours. You've got to know there's going to be slight differences with the perspective. You can usually see a uh, perspective change based Based on how their ears are presented. So this is quite a long shot. So you can see his art, his ears coming out. Yeah, on this one, it's quite close to the ears getting tucked behind. So that shows me that the perspective is different. You can still make some shape. So if we draw a line across here, you can somewhat get an assessment of where his mouth's going to be. For example, the nose might be getting a bit too elongated here and you want to move the mouth up slightly. And that's going to be in combination with the first observation we made, which was moving the chin up. Um, and also once you've sort of blocked off this area, we can start to to see subshapes. So one of the subshapes I can see is basically this area here. And what you've got is almost like a half. He's got a very cylindrical jaw that's going on, bowing down like a inverted arc. Uh, now, if you try and replicate that on with the, the triangles that we made, with yours, it's a little bit sharper. So it's a very acute angle here. So if you just want to replicate that back to the likeness, um, you'd be sort of aiming around this area, the similarities from the reference that we made and how close they can be. So another tip when it comes to likeness is definitely don't get too religious with one of your reference shots because they're all going to be different. It can almost be, you can almost waste a lot of time switching between references and trying to match it. You just want to make generalized observations that you can remember and then try and apply that to the mesh. So for example, we haven't matched this perfectly, but we've made a slight observation and we just try and replicate it. So in fact, what I suspect is you, you've probably used this um, reference quite a lot or just that angle, which can be useful because I can see that the lip shape is matching quite well. I'd be interested to see a side shot um, from here. I think from trying to achieve that kind of like pouty look that he has, you might have extended a little bit too far with these. So maybe just a fixing of that shape, um, especially around this area. Just want to make these slightly more subtle. Like if we look at um, some front shots, I can see the shadows and the highlights. And if you look along this word, there is actually quite a pronounced divot that goes in and it's almost the same around here. So instead of this um, from a side view, this this arching shape, you're going to have a bit more of um, an angled one like that just as it hits the lip. Again, likeness is so extremely difficult. Um, picking a difficulty on a game and representing that in games art, likeness is, is super, super difficult. But yeah, overall, um, a really good mesh. I also suggested when you do likeness, it's sometimes nice to basically hide the eyes because the eyes can throw it off quite a bit. So if you're asking for feedback, someone's going to look at it and they're going to think, um, right, there's something a little bit off. It's usually to do with the eyes. So I suggest just looking into the eye render, potentially reducing the whiteness of the eyes here. So just bringing the brightness value down and looking for a shading solution for ambient occlusion. So whether you're painting that in or maybe doing a floating translucent um, ambient occlusion. So it depends what renderer you have. In Unreal Engine, you can either put that into the shader or have some geometry on the front, which is the ambient occlusion. Though Marmoset does it slightly differently differently because it hasn't got that good of transparency models. But sometimes uh, what a useful thing to do is just, just rub out these areas and then you can focus on the skin without that throwing you off. You know, because as humans, we're naturally drawn to places like the, the mouth and the eyes to see the emotion of the character, to remove that so your subconscious doesn't mess with you. Um, and if we remove that, it's it's actually pretty good, you know. It looks close to this, this realistic effect. I probably just increase the subsurface because especially in areas like this where there's pitted pores, um, the transition from highlight to shadow is going to have a gray value and that gives kind of a CG looking effect or like a, a dead concrete effect. So if you just increase the subsurface, it's basically going to make these transitions that you can see in the pixels, just make them slightly red and that gives it a bit more of a realistic effect. Somewhat of that being represented here, but I think that's coming from a red light that you've inserted. Um, it's not so clear. Just just while I'm this er in this area, I've picked up uh, another bit of feedback. So if you look at the neck, this is sort of um, S-curving downwards. Um, what you've got here is a neck muscle that connects towards the back of the cranium and it basically goes straight down into your torso. In his representations, we've got uh, a straight line. Just as I say, it goes behind the onto the cranium. It's quite flat and straight like that. Obviously, he's twisting his neck, so it 
changes it slightly, um, but you want to replicate that. So just straighten up this area anatomically correct. You can see it from the front as well. Uh, so here we've got a sort of a neck angle that's going in towards the center of his body, whereas a lot of references, they just go straight down. Um, so that's going to make it look much better. Okay, next one we have is from Corey, and this is more of, I'd say, like a anatomy study. Really like to see this because it shows you different ways that muscles move and bones move depending on weight, for example, like the stretching of a scapula or the stretching of a muscle and how they look when you sculpt it. So it's really good for dynamic practice. Again, I'll take these into Photoshop. So again, this is a really cool pose. I think something that you've done quite well is get the, the dynamics and the curvature of the character. So you can see that in sort of the position of the fingers. And potentially, you've got a reference that's doing that. Musculature is quite good, especially like around the anatomy. Um, for example, the serratus is popping out a bit. In terms of feedback, you probably see a bit more stretching here. So for example, the pet, because that's uh, getting a lot of weighted load there, that's going to be quite tight. And also with the pit, that is also going to be quite tight. So there's a lot of stress weighting that's going on here. Usually what you'll find as well is because um, a lot of pressure is being put up here, the rib cage is going to pop out slightly. You might have some cavity, cavity areas under here. So maybe just some more shading. Um, I'd like to see the reference, to be honest, because it'd be interesting to see how, how their body's managing the weight of um, hanging from here. To me right now, the center of gravity is slightly off. So if we draw it from the anchor point, and obviously gravity is going to be pulling down this way, feels like um, this person is slightly towards the left. And so their arm is counter levering and that's sort of like changing the midpoint of the gravity. But I suspect that um, their hip would be going a bit more this way and the center line of their spine, I'd expect the angle to be just a bit more like this. It's more pronounced from the front. So if we draw that from down here, almost looks like uh, the person has a wall behind them and they're sort of letting that rest against them. Uh, what you want to do is more have a center line that I suspect would go down this way. So if I draw those, just uh, just angle this down like that. Front one's um, a little bit better. Good way to think about it is think about uh, how heavy certain aspects of the limbs are. So obviously the the arm's going to counter rotate and it's going to change the center of gravity. But a lot of the body kilograms and the weight is on the left side here. So what you suspect is because all of this area is so heavy, what it's going to do is going to want to originate itself back into the center line. So just a useful habit to get into is um, drawing the center lines. It's the same for if you're standing on the floor, uh, you just measure it from the center point of the foot and then go up and then start to position everything on either side. Not too sure and and not that it matters, but I can't understand the, the gender of this character. So so for example, though, I can't see any breasts, so that would indicate that it's a male. But when I look at the face, there are lots of feminine features there, especially in the, the shaping of the skull um, and also the broadness of the hips. That's sort of indicating to me that it's a female character. So again, it'd be very useful to see a reference just so you can match it. But there is a confusion of um, like skeletal structure. Ideally, got to go down one route for it to be a, like a homogenous character. So in terms of anatomy, I really like that you've done the shoulder pinching here. So that really indicates of where the bony landmarks are and the muscles that are basically wrapping around that. Um, maybe slight improvements on how the deltoid is dealing with that shape. So for example, it's getting a little bit lost here. The side and front view, um, the clavicle is getting slightly lost. So there's quite a bulky, I'm not too sure what that muscle would actually be because what you've got is quite a bony sternum here. Then you've got the clavicle, which is also bony that goes to the bony landmark that you've done. Basically anything in between that should be stretched in this sort of direction. So you'd have a very stretched pec is the blending of the deltoids and the pectoral muscles. So what you'd actually have is more of a, a gap inside of here. Maybe I can do a rudimentary draw over with some, some grays and shading, but what you'll find is this is gonna be sort of a lot flatter, more of a, a stretch over here with the highlight. And definitely this uh, this bulbous area would be a lot flatter. You're looking for a flatness here. And then somewhere in the center, you'd have sort of like a, the indication of a highlight. Now, obviously that's not, um, it's not looking great in terms of a 2D representation, but just by the highlights, you can start to see um, where this should be sort of like directed. So just a bit more shading to uh, bring out this clavicle. Maybe I can sort of blur this all away so you can vaguely see the representation. So now we have uh, a bit more bone structure and definitely you want to get a bit more of a, a shadowed highlight here just to separate the deltoid away slightly. In terms of the foot, I think there could be some more improvements. What I first observe is that the heel is quite wide in comparison to the rest of the foot. So this is very thin. It's almost turning into a bit of um, a swimmer's flipper. 
So you just want to increase the broadness here. And you also want to bring back some fatty padded areas. So for example, you've got a nice arch here and obviously the foot is bending because it can't do that. I uh, just want to increase the fat pads here, and especially around this knuckle. When the big toe is flexed inwards, what you have is a lot of crunching of masses sort of like this. So you really want to increase the mass there and also the same same here because the skin on the inside is bulking up, especially with that hard end. Missing a bit of uh, like tenderness here and fascia. So the arch might be a bit too extreme. So might, what you might want to do is just increase the, the fat pads on the outside and reduce the, the amount of arch on the center. The arch is usually okay on the inside, but with yours, it goes and extends right into the center and that's still quite a big arch. So just flatten that area slightly and it'll give more of a realistic look. So representation here is pretty good. Um, you can see a slight amount of bulking there. I'd increase the, the size of the toes going to be folding inwards. Also what happens around the ankle, um, especially as the foot's been pointed like this, you're going to have quite a divot concave area here. And that's basically going to make the, the ankle bone a bit more prominent and come outwards. So we'll do our, do our blurry thing here. Basically what that's going to do is bring out the tendon, which is uh, contracting quite extremely. So if you imagine if you're doing for people who like go to the gym and do like calf raises to put their foot forwards, they have to tense quite a lot of their, their calf muscle up here. So what you'd usually find is that this would be slightly bulged out and the muscle itself would be heightened quite a lot. And then from that, what you would find is that the tendon would be getting a lot tighter. And then because all of this is compressing this way, you'd have a lot of skin folding. And basically wherever there's a tight tendon like this and a bony landmark in between, there's going to be this sort of um, caved in chasm of skin that's kind of just trying to go over that surface. So if you look at it from the side, uh, if we look at it from this angle, for example, you'd have the tendon here which is round and basically the bit in between with yours it's quite flat just like that the way you'd want to sculpt it is just have it arch like this and it's going to give a nice highlight down here yeah overall really good attempt um now moving on to the head usually what to do is uh draw a bit of an angle again it depends on the character but what i think is happening here is that the the forehead are floating a bit too far away from the center point of the head. So I usually like to measure it from the head's connection to the neck. Um, and this distance is quite grand. So you just want to pull, maybe get a big move tool and just get this area and move it in slightly just so it's not bulging forward as much. Now that usually involves just repositioning the eyes. So you're going to get the eyeballs and move them back ever so slightly. Same is also true with uh, this piece. So just underneath the eye leading from the nose all the way basically to the side of the mouth onto the inside as well. Usually the way I like to draw it is uh, draw the eyeball and draw it down the center of the face. And usually this area is quite flat. You can usually put your hand on front of that's basically towards the center of your nose. So what you might find as well is that the back of the nose will be moving back along with all this fatty deposit and you're going to be aiming sort of like the center of the eye. So in combination with bringing the, the eyeball itself backwards and also the forehead structure back in this direction, it's going to make it look uh, a lot better. Sometimes what you can do is you can get um, one of your layers and make a, a duplicate of the head. And usually what I do is I just copy this off to the side, press uh, in Photoshop, you just press control T. And then you come up here, you can find this uh, sort of transform warp mode. And that can be sometimes quite useful. You can sort of generally warp the size of the face. So the first observation we made was just basically the, the size of the forehead. So this would be coming down and back again. And you can see how that's already made a bit of an improvement in terms of the structure. You can move backwards from this. Now with this tool, we won't be able to make the edits of the eyes, but we can interpret it ever so slightly, moving these sections back. Now what's, once that's done, uh, what we can do is just add a little bit of fake shading like I was doing previously, um, or use something like the liquidation. So if you go into filter and then liquefy, sometimes be good. Obviously it's not perfect because you're not actually moving the 3D object. But what I suspect to see is just moving these areas back slightly, maybe even the eye itself, obviously the head structure and a lot of where the nose is connecting to the main head. This is, should be moving back a bit. And as well with the, uh, the sort of cheekbones could be a also a case that the ear is slightly misdirected. So I bring this back and also make it a little bit wider. In general, you're aiming for the top of the brow. So obviously if we bring the brow downwards and with the bottom of the ear, you're sort of aiming for the bottom of the nose um, and it's usually on the back half of the side head so if we're drawing a center line here you want to be on the back end of that also what i'd like to see here is just a bit more definition of the side of the mandible because right now it's just vanishing in skin towards the side now if you imagine you're rotating your head either way that side jaw and that mandible is always going to poke out poke out no matter what the skin's just gonna stretch on top of it so you can try and sort of insert that with a bit of shading if i try and find uh, a darker color here just want to shade it in in sort of like 
like this area, it's going to be a very tight transition. You're going to bring more of the jaw and you can see there's um, now what's happening is a, a better definition in between the neck muscle that it's being strained and also the bony landmark there. So just a couple of improvements between from this to that. Obviously the character might look a, a certain way or, or their head proportions might be off um, but without seeing a reference that's the the changes that I'd make basically. So here we got a bit of um, topology ready for feedback. Persons mentioned that it's uh, not intended for a games engine so it's just practice uh, for animation maybe it could be used for CG. Um, so if that's the case when it's not used for games because we won't be using pieces of geometry inside of the game it makes it a lot harder because of the budgets and that's why topology is really important for games. When it comes to CG, it doesn't really matter that much. The main thing with CG is as long as it's supporting, um, we don't really care too much about edge flow, for example, because we can just insert more pieces of geometry. So in terms of CG flow, it looks pretty good. Um, you've got certain areas that are popping out and you've got edge flow and vertices to support that. Um, with the back muscles, you're obviously going to get a lot of stretching, more specifically in the lats. Uh, so this muscle here, that's going to stretch quite a lot. And the direction of the stretch usually happens from the lower back up towards the arm. So if we draw a line here, you ideally want to have a bit more of a grid-like system here. So when you have that stretch, you have more loops that you can insert for support. So you've kind of got the indication, but the only problem is that there's a pole. An, animate, an animator might find this a little bit hard because what you've got is almost like the triangulation of edge flow. So if you imagine trying to open up that triangulation of edge flow, it could be quite difficult. You'd lose a lot of form structure and a lot of texture structure. So in general, whenever you see a direction, you want to insert um, a grid. The areas it is pretty good as you've got that follows the contour of the cavity but again i would potentially i wouldn't even put that in especially around the lower trap area and this shoulder blade you don't usually see a lot of deformation and opening that's sort of like the rhomboid area is going to open up it, it will only about double in size so you don't need too much form structure fold the back moves forwards like this what will happen is this cavity trapezius is that's actually going to vanish so you don't necessarily need any form structure there to sort of like indicate and bring it out because the skin's going to stretch in all manner of different directions piece i'd really focus on around the shoulder this is going to be one of the most important pieces of geometry. Um, currently, this is quite good. So you've got an internal line that rests just for the shoulder. So if this shoulder comes up, you're gonna it's gonna allow for a lot of pinching. Potentially, what isn't as good is basically the flow that comes from the back here and then leads into the center. You've got some quite big pieces of quad here. And when it comes to the animator, um, what they really want is they want lots of geometry because that's gonna be compressing it and expanding a lot. So imagine if this arm is rotated upwards, uh, the animator is gonna want a lot of active points. Whereas currently, there's only a couple to play with, so you might have a bit of texture distortion there. So as a general rule of thumb, just put lots of geometry following the shape of the arm and how it radiates around. The front is good. I think it's um, maintaining all the structures here. So for example, the rib cage, the abs, serratus, and the pec is defined well. Now, when it comes to around the neck area, I tend not to like to follow the form too much. I take preference on uh, how it's basically going to animate. So right here, you've got some looping loops that come up in, so that could cause a little bit of, ideally, you just want to model this almost like a straight, really keep to that grid system. And that's going to help when it comes to twisting contortion and also bending side to side. So if you imagine you've got these, um, if you keep these loops arching from the bottom upwards, and these are arching from the top downwards. When an animator starts to move the neck side to side or twist that, they're going to have a lot of problems with um, blend weighting that together. So ideally just go for a nice cylindrical shape like this. But uh, what you have done well is basically keeping this muscle. So that muscle is used quite a lot connecting from the clavicle towards the back of the... Um, obviously when you're twisting, sometimes that is um, popping out quite a lot and sometimes it vanishes. So to have that structure is very good. Uh, in terms of like pectoral and shoulder and arm movement, I usually like to have a couple of edges or edge strip that leads in this direction and then goes down towards the pec. And that basically means that the, because that's where the pec's connection is, it, all, it always means that when this arm is rotating in different directions like this, you're always going to have the supporting structure of the muscle. Um, so if that doesn't exist, sometimes what happens is the pec's connection sort of vanishes and what you get is a disconnection. So if you imagine this arm going upwards, 
what you have is the pec sort of stays there and then the arm topology comes up here and you're left with this weird um this chasm that isn't accurate whereas if you have edge loop of quads down here if you imagine every time the arm moves into different directions what you've got is this bend is just either straightening out like that or it's coming up this way and then it just supports the um the angle of the arm and keeps that anatomy straight um so it's just the the important areas are basically the neck making sure that's deformed uh any sort of deformation animation on the pectoral is also useful but apart from that i think you've done well you know you've got a nice grid system on the trunk that's going to animate quite well uh, it does look like the face facial topology is good you've got some some nice loops there maybe starting to get a little bit too fancy on the arms you know just keep them nice and simple um especially around the bicep maybe you want to do the same as you did with the back of the neck so for example these um these are crisscrossing and blending blending out into different areas whereas on one of your previous ones say for example spinal segment here that's popping out you've supported that well with geometry you basically want to do the same with the bicep and you've done the same for the tricep and the elbow so just do what you've done here but translate it back onto the bicep because that the bicep needs to hold a lot of structure if you imagine even sometimes it turns into a ball so it's going to need that nice geometry to basically support it and so uh, another user gave some really good information and it's also on the same lengths of um, where things like compression and stretching happens uh, this is a really good point as well obviously when you're shrugging your shoulders and bringing your scapula up get a lot of compression around the trap area and what's being indicated uh, the user is indicating here is that this is where the range of motion is going to be uh, and that's where the topology needs to be positioned to facilitate that nice compression so that's that's often a one obviously if the person's pulling their elbows um their shoulders back that's going to happen a lot can be a very difficult one i don't know if i would necessarily put a scapula geometry inside of there because what happens is when the when the arms move the scapula rotates at such an extreme degree it's very hard to uh, maintain this sort of structure and what you've got is a very big trapeze muscle that goes down here and there's different segments to it there's the upper lower and mid and basically what this muscle is used for is complete rotation if you're putting your arms above your head what's happening is this is compressing and flexing to basically move the bottom half of the scapula this is pulling up in this direction and what's happening is it's physically rotating um, so it's almost impossible to min maintain that and all the scapular bone is basically going to move beneath the skin so unless there's um, an extreme rigging solution usually in the, the higher end studios we can put in like um, bone and muscle simulation um, ideally just go for very basic uh, form and compression and it usually means it when when the arms are coming up here you want a lot of stretching in this direction you now fundamentally this is kind of all semantics it's no matter what happens as long as you've got enough geometry it's going to work uh, it's just these little little thoughts can sometimes help the the animator out a little bit but uh, yeah definitely agree on sort of having this nice compression grid up there and then you can work and test for yourself what sort of compression you want down this this direction um and also on that note i basically i'd basically avoid any sort of looping swirliness like this because the animator is not going to like that so it's really it's for it's following the form very well but ideally what you want is just to straighten that out and have a grid system and then to support that bulk you just have some more active points so next piece of feedback is for this stylized character and uh stylized generic feedback can be quite difficult when you're posting sort of like a work in progress or looking for feedback just try and suggest something that you're aiming for because stylized is such a, a broad spectrum i can kind of guess what you're along the lines of what you're going for you know are the textures going to be stylized but the sculpt itself is realistic or is it going to be vice versa you're going to sort of have like stylized textures and kind of like a realistic sculpt so there's a broad range of um, stylized generalized feedback for something that's a stylized i'd like to see a bit more indication of unique brush strokes or like unique brushes for example if you look at um stylized zbrush characters you'll often find they have a very defined set of angles on them so using things like edge polish or um some kind of like slash curve to bring out a certain amount of edges so if you take this character for example you can see where the artist has picked and choose where to insert kind of like sharp edges um, and also when it comes to cloth folds this this shirt's somewhat similar to yours just inserted one or two landmarks that really indicate what's happening with the cloth folds doesn't have to be anything too generic same with the trousers the trousers are usually quite hard because it's a flat surface um, but just where the crinkles and the folds are going to happen just get a nice sharp brush and radiate from that direction with this as well um, the decision to make sort of sub folds that indicate the flow of hair so i think with yours currently you've got quite a flat and smooth surface so you might just want to indicate the flow of the hair and introduce sharper 
sharper lines. Um, and in general, with any sort of stylized character, it's just sharpen up areas. You don't really want to see too much of these smooth transitions. Um, the idea behind stylize is that it's very easy on the eye, so you can quite clearly see larger forms. Um, so usually if something's a bit too smooth, um, it doesn't give that that stylized effect. So maybe come in here with a different brush, like um, a trim dynamic or an H polish, or maybe a damn standard. Pinch brush can be really useful just to sharpen up. So a pinch brush would do really well on the corner uh, of your clothing here. So the final bit of feedback I'll give is for this UE4 render. And it's nice that you've included the lighting setup so I can see what's going on here. So in terms of final render, I think that the overall lighting could be improved, but the textures you've got here are quite interesting. So the uh, the horrible embossment of the skin is, is shining quite well. I don't know if it's meant to be realistic skin or it's a sort of a representation, but because the specularity is so low uh, and the roughness is so high, it's kind of coming off a little bit like concrete. So I don't know what you're going for, but um, if you are going for skin, just increase or decrease the roughness, maybe put some subsurface elements and make it shine a little bit more. In terms of lighting, I expect to see a bit more of a harsher, broad shadow. So pick one of these sides and you'll see a lot of shading. And then that's going to basically bring out the 3D elements. Um, something you have already included is somewhat of a, a rim light. So that's nice because it separates it from the background. But I think the main light could be improved just to introduce a bit more shading and a bit more physicality into the front. Maybe a change of uh, background as well, because right now you've got your scene lights that are getting picked up on the bottom. Ideally, you don't want to see that. So, so decide whether you want a flat plate. Maybe it's like a, a rendered or simulated piece of cloth that's going to look nice, or it's just a flat shaded background. If I do a quick Google search and just see for dramatic lighting, uh, basically what I'm saying is the, the separation of the main highlight. So you really want to let those rest and potentially make a decision if you want to use a very faint emotion you're going for. I guess your piece is a bit more um, artistic and trying to chase that specific mood. So maybe take one of these pictures that resonates with what you're trying to say and then just try and replicate that. There's loads of resources out there, just generic film and photography resources for po um, for portrait shots. So say, for example, here we're using quite a broad main light and then just filling in the darkness of the shadow with a, with a tiny light. And what you'll see from your scene composition, um, not too sure what's happening here with all the spots lights you wouldn't really do that you just decide to pick one light and then have that cast on top uh, it might cost a lot in terms of um, over rendering especially if you've got a lot of shadows it could be taking your uh, dynamic scene down something that i like to do and i'll probably make a video about it later is basically you want to take one of these lights and create a second viewport and then you're just going to pilot that and then with the wasd in the mouse button you can actually fly and look around with that then in your second viewport you can see if the effect that's having so in your second viewport you'd have have your camera locked on and then you'd be positioning that light. So I'm assuming that this would be your main light down here. Um, and then all the spotlights that you have here are basically drowning out any form of shadow. It might be an idea to basically either delete these or just deactivate them momentarily and then focus on just one light, see what effect that ha has had. And if it has like a, an interesting shadow and then slowly start to introduce more lights. So in fact, um, it's not in Unreal Engine, but I go over that workflow in the essential lighting techniques. So I'll link that um, down in the description. So this is in Marmoset. I'm going to show you a formula. For oh God. This this follows the same sort of sort of process of setting up multiple cameras, starting with one or two lights that you can just preview by hiding the others. Watch through that and see what sort of approach and workflow is taken for adding additional lights. By the end of it, you should have something that's um, a little bit more 3D and, and popping out of the screen. But at a later date, I'll definitely make a Unreal Engine video. So subscribe and I'll... Cool. So overall, really good works from everyone. I think we covered a broad range. We got sort of like stylized, some anatomy reference likeness sculpt in engine rendering and topology so i think that was a, a really cool broad range of um subjects to cover in terms of feedback i'll probably do another one of these basically when i see it when it comes into the industry and we're having art meetings for example that got characterized in usually I like to just have a straight meeting instead of giving written feedback so if you're interested in getting a bit of feedback i'll be looking through the discord channel so make sure you join the 3d mutiny discord and also post at any point your art feedback so we've got an art feedback channel we also have 
have a work in progress and showcase with the showcase is sort of a bit less about feedback work in progress obviously um, pieces are unfinished and people are looking to receive feedback before they, they finish their final product art feedback is more um, that they're sort of like approaching a finished product and just looking for their final bits of adjustments before they start to send it out and there's also the help channel so if you're having any technical problems um, this is the place to ask it and hopefully some some users can answer those questions or you yourself can answer them so if you enjoyed the format so if you enjoyed that format leave a like so i can understand what videos i'm going to be making in the future got about um six to ten videos on the back burner that i'm busy finding time to edit so those are going to be released over the next couple of uh, weeks so make sure you subscribe to receive those so thanks for watching and i'll catch you on the next one